Welcome to the Revenge Story Times channel, sweetheart. What happened? What's going on? Caroline Carr asked her daughter when Missy burst into the family home. She hugged her sobbing daughter, patting her back with one hand and stroking her head with the other. Ben left, Missy cried out. He sent this to me at work, she exclaimed, pulling away from her mother before thrusting an envelope into her father's hands. Caroline hugged her daughter and pressed her to her chest. Frank Carr took the envelope before opening it. He asked Missy, where's Benjamin? Is he with Ben? In her state, Missy couldn't drive with a small child. Yes, Missy exhaled between sobs and tears. Earlier that same day, Ben had taken Kevin, their youngest son, to Frank and Caroline and asked them to look after him since he had some business with Benjamin. Less than two hours later, Missy called her parents, nearly hysterical after receiving the divorce papers at work. She arrived at their home in tears. Frank sat in the armchair while his wife and daughter collapsed into each other's arms on the couch. Caroline stroked her daughter's hair as she cried on her mother's chest. Frank took the documents out of the envelope and read the divorce petition on the first page. He shook his head grimly as he read. There had been no warning or discussion between his soon-to-be ex-son-in-law and Missy. That scumbag served her with the papers at her workplace with no prior notice, leading to shock, sorrow, and humiliation, he thought. When Frank finished reading, he looked up in confusion. Missy, he's filing on the grounds of infidelity. Did you cheat on him? No. He got it into his head that I was having an affair with a colleague at work. It's not true. I never cheated on Ben. I love him, Missy's last words came out as a scream, like the howl of a wounded animal. I'll nail his ass to the wall of my office, Frank thought to himself. He's making up ridiculous accusations to tarnish Missy's reputation and push for a divorce. That son of a gun has probably been cheating on her. As he continued reading the divorce filing, Frank felt his left eyebrow rise, a clear sign of his displeasure. Missy, what made Ben think you were in on him? Missy looked at her father angrily, then gave her mother a pleading look. I don't know, maybe I hugged one of our salesmen when he made a big sale? The statement came out as a question as Missy tried to figure out what her husband might have seen and misinterpreted. And that was all, an innocent hug with a colleague. Missy continued to look at her father, clearly irritated. He kissed me during happy hour after work. I had too much to drink, and as soon as I realized what was happening, I pushed him away. But that's all that happened, I swear. As Frank continued reading, his eyebrow kept inching up toward his forehead, a reaction that did not go unnoticed by his wife. What are you getting at, Frank? Caroline asked with irritation in her voice. Are you accusing your daughter of something? No, or at least not yet. But we've known Ben for what, seven or eight years? I work with him every day. This is completely unlike him, so I'm trying to understand what's going on in his mind, Frank explained, his own backside meeting Caroline's snap. Continuing to comfort Missy, Caroline handed her a box of tissues, and soon a pile of used tissues began to grow on the coffee table in front of Missy. How can you even think of taking his side after what he's done to our daughter? I'm not taking anyone's side until I finish reading this petition, Frank replied. Who does he accuse you of cheating with, Frank, he asked his daughter. And why does he think it was an affair rather than just an innocent hug and a drunken kiss? Missy pulled away from her mother and wiped her face with a tissue. He thinks I had an affair with Andy AAR, one of our sales reps but that's not true. He must have seen something, misunderstood it. Frank slowly nodded. And what could he have seen? Missy began crying again. Frank's expression slowly shifted from one of understanding and sympathy to what his wife called his stone face as he continued reading through the documents. Ben is requesting to split custody of Benjamin 50-50, naming himself as the custodial parent. Frank looked at his daughter with a grim expression. He's not requesting custody or visitation for the minor known as Kevin Andrew Davis. He is also asking that his name be removed from Kevin's birth certificate and that Kevin's last name be changed. Caroline and Missy both gasped at this revelation. 
Missy collapsed into her mother's arms, sobbing and wailing. Missy, look at me, Frank said loudly, overriding her cries. Missy stopped crying and looked at her father. Caroline Carr looked at her husband with concern, noticing his lack of empathy for their daughter. Ben has accused you of having an affair with Andy A. Aber. Kevin's middle name is Andrew because you said you always liked that name. I'm asking you again, did you cheat on Ben with this guy, Andy? In response, Missy let out a loud wail and began sobbing even harder in her mother's arms. Caroline glared at her husband in anger. Can you please stop this, she hissed. Did you know? Frank asked his wife with a stony expression. No, what exactly? Frank saw the fury building in his wife's eyes, but he held up a sheet of paper. This is why Ben isn't asking for any custody of Kevin. It's a DNA test showing that the probability of Ben being Kevin's father is less than 0.002%. So tell me, Caroline, how long have you known about this? After nearly 30 years of marriage, Caroline knew her husband better than he knew himself. She understood that their marriage was teetering on the edge. If she admitted to her husband that Missy had told her she wasn't sure who the father of the child was, Frank might very well divorce her. However, if she lied and Frank found out she had lied, their marriage would definitely be over, but only if he found out. Caroline shook her head and made her decision. I didn't know. I'm hearing this for the first time. I think Missy is as shocked as we are. I doubt that, Frank said dryly. But there's one way to put my mind at ease. I want to see both of your phones. Caroline suddenly stood up and pointed angrily at her husband. You will not invade our private lives, she said firmly. You will not dig through our phones. Frank looked at his wife and slowly nodded. They say that people with nothing to hide, hide nothing. I assume you both have something to hide. So let me make this very clear to eliminate any chance of misunderstanding. Either you both unlock your phones and hand them over to me right now, or I will file for divorce tomorrow. Caroline looked at her husband with eyes narrowed in fury. I have never given you a reason to distrust me. We are not giving up our phones, and we are not getting a divorce. Frank looked at her grimly. Over the years, I've caught you in numerous small lies. I always ignored them, thinking the argument that would arise from them wasn't worth the trouble. I'm ashamed that I allowed this all these years. I think those lies covered up infidelity until today. I wouldn't have even considered this, but now, watching our daughter try to deceive her husband into raising another man's child, to hell with this noise. The gloves are off. It's your phones or a divorce. And if either of you thinks I'm bluffing, go ahead and test me. This was a side of Frank that neither Caroline nor Missy had ever seen. The grim determination in his face left no room for compromise. Screw you, Caroline shouted with a vicious sneer. I'll bleed you dry in the divorce. I'll take everything you have, and you'll be lucky if you're left living in your car. Frank stood up from the armchair tossing the papers onto the coffee table. He looked at his wife and daughter, shaking his head as he headed to the kitchen. A minute later, he returned, carrying a Ziploc bag. He flipped the bag inside out over his hand, using it like a glove, and collected a handful of used tissues lying in front of Missy. He then turned the bag back to its regular position, sealing the tissues inside by pressing the zipper closed between his thumb and forefinger. What are you doing? Caroline's voice rose to a scream. She trembled with barely contained rage as she pointed at the bag of used tissues that lay in nearly 30 years of marriage. Frank had never encountered this side of her personality. He began to wonder if he had ever truly known his wife at all. I'm going to find out who Ben used for the DNA analysis to determine that Kevin wasn't his son, and I'm also going to find out if Missy is really my daughter or if you've been lying to me for almost 30 years. Caroline screamed and lunged at Frank, digging her nails into his face. If you haven't experienced it yourself, it's hard to describe the feeling of having the wind knocked out of you. It's a phrase people say often, but most have never truly felt it. Being winded causes panic as the air is suddenly forced out of your lungs, deflating them. 
The inability to breathe or take in even a bit of air instills terror, making you feel as though you're about to die. The seconds it takes for your lungs to refill with air feel like minutes as your body desperately struggles to breathe. In his youth, Frank had practiced karate for six years, and although that was 40 years ago, some things are never forgotten. When his wife's nails dug into his face, Frank struck the upper part of Caroline's solar plexus with the palm of his hand. The blow was not hard, in fact, Frank knew that any bruising would be minimal if it even appeared at all. But what it did was knock all the air out of Caroline's lungs, leaving her rolling on the floor, gasping for breath in terror, unable to inhale. This sent Caroline into a panic, which in turn panicked Missy as she saw her mother clutch her throat, struggling to breathe. While his wife was still rolling on the floor, Frank quickly headed to the back of the house, where his home office was located. He knew that in about a minute, Caroline would start breathing normally again, and he wanted to be out of the house as soon as possible. Frank grabbed his laptop and tablet, quickly accessed their Wi-Fi router, and changed the router's password. Caroline could still use her phone to access the internet, but she never did anything on it besides scrolling through social media. Any banking or credit card transaction she wouldn't be able to perform on the computer without Wi-Fi. Frank quickly tossed a couple of changes of clothes into a backpack and left the house, passing by his wife, who was sitting up, taking deep breaths. And with that, he said goodbye to 30 years of what had seemed like a happy marriage. Frank drove quickly until he reached the nearest fast food restaurant, where he used their Wi-Fi to go online. Frank logged into American Express, paid off, and closed their joint Amex Gold card. Then he logged into Chase, paid off, and closed their joint Chase credit card. Before accessing Chase bill pay and writing a check to himself, depositing half of the remaining balance from their joint account into his landscaping company's account, Frank had long registered his company as a sole proprietorship. Hello, Adam, Frank said in a flat, emotionless tone. Hello, Adam, Frank replied to his future ex-son-in-law's father. It's one hell of a situation, isn't it? Couldn't be worse, Adam said, opening the door for Frank. Let's head out to the patio and watch the golfers, Bourbon? The Davis home was situated in a cul-de-sac next to the golf course of the country club where both families were members. Adam's wife had won the club's women's championship for the past four years, a fact of which Adam was extremely proud. Settling on the Davis patio with a bourbon in hand, Frank started the conversation. How's Ben doing? Adam tilted his head toward Frank as if to say, seriously? I know, stupid question. What he's going through is almost the worst thing a man can face, I would say, except for losing a child. But that's exactly what he's going through, isn't it? He's losing his youngest son, and you're losing your youngest grandson. How could Missy do this to him? What happened to that girl? Frank sighed and shook his head. She was always spoiled, and instead of putting my foot down, I just turned a blind eye. I guess that makes me as much to blame as anyone. Adam shrugged. Maybe, but probably not. She's an adult, fully capable of making her own decisions and taking responsibility for her actions. Frank nodded in agreement before taking a sip of bourbon. Where's Ben hiding? I assume Benjamin is with him? They're at the lake house. He doesn't want to see or talk to Missy, and a four-year-old boy is too young to watch his mom go through a breakdown. It's probably for the best that Kevin isn't even a year old yet. He won't remember Ben, though I can't say the same for Ben. He was so happy to have two little boys. Frank shook his head sadly, tears in his eyes. I understand. I don't want to see her either, or her mother. Turns out my sweet, loving wife knew all along that there was a chance Ben wasn't the boy's father and didn't say a damn thing to me about it. Now I'm beginning to suspect I might not be Missy's father, and I left Caroline. Good lord, Adam said, exhaling slowly. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, you said, hold my beer. Frank raised his glass to Adam in silent acknowledgement. Adam added, as angry as I am, you should see babe. She scares the hell out of me. Babe Davis had been Adam's wife for 32 years, the daughter of a ranch owner and a talented athlete throughout high school and college. She was named after the world-renowned athlete in Port Arthur, Texas native, 
Babe Didrikson Zaharias. Like her namesake, Babe Davis Nay Landry excelled in tennis and golf in high school and college. She even spent a year competing against professionals as an amateur in LPGA tournaments before becoming pregnant with Ben. If Missy weren't Benjamin's mother, I seriously think she'd shoot Missy. I've never seen her so angry, Adam continued. Frank shook his head. Keep her in check. I don't want her getting into trouble over these two. It's enough that I'll probably end up in jail. You, jail? What the hell, Frank? Does this have something to do with the bandages on your face? Frank had stopped at CVS to buy Neosporin and a face bandage before arriving at Adam and Babe's house. Frank nodded and recounted to Adam the story of how he collected Missy's used tissues for DNA testing and the subsequent attack by Caroline, which ended with him striking her in the stomach. Good lord, Frank, Adam looked at Frank with a touch of admiration. Normally, I wouldn't condone hitting a woman, but damn, if there was ever someone who deserved a good kick in the rear, that's exactly how it was. But I know those two will come up with a different story, so I figure I'll be getting arrested soon. That's what I wanted to talk about. Could you reach out to Ben and let him know he'll have to manage on his own for a while? His son-in-law not only worked at Frank's landscaping company but also acquired a 25% share of the business. Of course. He has a disposable phone, and I'll make sure to give you the number. Their conversation was interrupted when Babe, Adam's wife, walked through the kitchen and into the study. She looked coldly at Frank, keeping her eyes fixed on him as she asked her husband, what's he doing here? And why is the police pulling up the driveway? Relax, dear. Frank is on Ben's side in all of this. It turns out Caroline knew all about Missy's affair and that Kevin might not be Ben's son. Frank left home. Whatever Adam was about to say was cut off by the sound of the doorbell. Babe opened the door for the police officers and at their question turned to Frank, who nodded in acknowledgement. I figured this would happen, he said, approaching the door to greet the officers, who quickly turned him around and put handcuffs on him. The officer seated Frank and asked him to give his account of the events. When he described Caroline's attack on him and his defensive actions, showing them the scratches on his face, the officers responded sympathetically yet indifferently. If you had called us right then, we probably would have arrested her, not you. I'll ask Ben to get your lawyer involved, Adam said. Babe hugged Frank as the police let him out. Six months had passed, and the storm of outrage had mostly subsided. Missy fought Ben in the divorce, initially demanding counseling and, when that was denied, imposing very burdensome conditions. A DNA test confirmed that Missy was indeed Frank's daughter, which left him with mixed feelings. He had always loved Missy because she was his daughter, but he felt no respect for her. They communicated very little, and Frank did not expect that to change anytime soon. She had denied him any contact with his grandson Kevin, based on a photograph of Frank taken at the pharmacy, clearly showing nail marks and scratches on his face. Frank was found not guilty of the Class C misdemeanor charge of assaulting his wife. Frank was divorcing Caroline, he neither trusted nor respected her. She fought the divorce as well, with her lawyers setting up obstacle after obstacle, and they would have continued if Caroline and Missy had not been attacked in the parking lot of a nightclub they visited together. Although they couldn't describe the attacker, parking lot cameras captured a small man dressed entirely in black and wearing a ski mask who, wielding what appeared to be a thin, weighted stick, mercilessly assaulted both women. The footage showed the two women being beaten with a steel rod until it bent and became deformed. From their hospital beds, the pair claimed they had no idea who had attacked them and that the only person with a motive was Missy's husband, who was seeking a divorce. However, given his height of 6 feet 3 inches, Ben Davis was ruled out as a suspect. Although an open investigation was conducted into the assault, there were no leads or suspects. The two women, though severely injured with several broken bones and missing teeth, did not sustain any permanent damage. Caroline and Missy stopped going to nightclubs, and as their paranoia about further attacks grew, they spent most of their time at home, aggravating each other. They allowed their divorces to proceed without further resistance. Custody of Benjamin was settled on a 50-50 basis, with Ben designated as the custodial parent. 
neither Ben nor Missy was awarded child support or spousal maintenance. Ben's name was removed from Kevin's birth certificate and a court-ordered DNA test confirmed that Andrew A. Abair was Kevin's father. Andy was required to pay child support to Missy. Andy's wife filed for divorce on grounds of infidelity, and he was also ordered to pay child support for his three children, as well as court-ordered spousal support for her. Since, at Andy's insistence, his wife had been a stay-at-home mother since their first child was born, this left Andy in a state of near poverty from which he was unlikely to recover. With the support and love of his parents, Ben managed to endure the turmoil caused by his unfaithful wife. He continued working for Frank and kept investing in the landscaping business. His son Benjamin was healthy and happy, except for the times he had to stay with his mother at Caroline's house. These visits saddened him because his mother seemed either angry at his father or inconsolably crying about missing him. His grandmother appeared to be in a constant state of rage, directed at his grandfather. The fact that Frank had become a highly sought-after partner among single women at their country club only fueled the fire burning inside Caroline. Adam and Babe continued to support their son and grandson whenever needed. Babe won the women's golf championship for the fifth year in a row despite missing a few clubs from her golf set. Thank you for listening until the end. See you in the next episode of Revenge Story. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. Goodbye.